This is ABC Fora. <clears throat> Thank you very much, guys. Um, uh, we had that very moving welcome to country earlier from Glenn, and uh, I'm now moved to say that we're going to move quickly from the sacred to the profane. I've been reading uh, Christopher Hitchens' work for uh, many years now. I almost said religiously, but I thought better of that. <laughs> In the past decade, I've been lucky enough to interview him uh, on many occasions by satellite link from remote studios in various parts of the United States. And because we tend to do that live, for him, where he's sitting, it usually turns out to be some ungodly hour. But, excuse another pun. <laughs> As we know, Mr. Hitchens is a rather ungodly person. Now, with Christopher Hitchens being the sort of fellow that he is, with a kind of healthy appetites that he has, and frankly, that we expect of him. He has, on occasion, been somewhat the worse for wear during those interviews. <laughs> there was one particularly memorable occasion when he spent much of the interview doing a very amusing live commentary on the technical expertise of the sound man and the camera crew. <laughs> That's when I knew that one of his hidden talents was for John Cleese impersonations. <laughs> Now, there is, I suspect, a very special Hitchens archive somewhere out there in some corner of YouTube, so let me know if you find it, will you? But I have to say, uh, cometh the hour, cometh the man, because no matter how little sleep he's had, no matter what his state of occasional dishevelment is, and no matter how incompetent the studio crew, Christopher Hitchens has always risen to the occasion. He's a man who must be heard and who should be heard. And I may be somewhat biased here, but I regard him as among a handful of public intellectuals in the world who have the capacity to really lead a new public discourse and the courage and the inclination to adopt contrarian positions and defend them with great passion and great subtlety. Moreover, Christopher Hitchens has never, uh, to my knowledge, ducked a debate, although many of his opponents have ducked debates with him. And having seen him in action up close, I frankly don't blame them. I met Christopher for the first time in New York on September the 11th, 2002. It was our job to sit together for a few hours and talk in front of a live camera on a windswept building across from that ghastly hole in the ground where the World Trade Center and its surrounding buildings had one year before been amputated from the New York skyline by the actions of a small group of Islamic terrorists. Now, when I was asked by the ABC to go to New York and do the first anniversary broadcast, I had only one condition, and that is, I'll do it if we can persuade Christopher Hitchens to join us. The reason for that was simple. Christopher had thought more deeply and more profoundly about September 11 and its implications than anyone I'd read or heard talking about it at that time, and his own battles with Islamic extremism dated back to the fatwa against his friend, the writer Salman Rushdie. And you can see consistent streams of thought about God and religion flowing through the book that he's here to talk about tonight and the ideas that he's going to talk about tonight. The book is God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything. If you haven't read it, I can tell you that Islam is not the only nor even the primary target. This is not his satanic verses. Christopher is an equal opportunity and multi-faith debunker. So, if you're a Christian, Roman, Catholic, Orthodox, or otherwise, if you're a Hindu, if you're a religious Jew, if you're a Muslim, Buddhist, a Gnostic, or even just an occasional visitor to a Shinto shrine, you can expect to be offended, or at least have your views challenged in ways you perhaps didn't expect. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the podium journalist, writer, lifelong contrarian, and militant atheist, Christopher Hitchens. Thank you, um, Your Reverence, um, <laughs> for that suspiciously terse, grudging introduction. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, very much for coming. Thank you for laying on an evening of weather to remind me of my English boyhood. <laughs> In other ways, to make me feel at home, as I always do when I visit Sydney, which is uh, the only place I've so far visited where, if you stay in the neighborhood I am staying, 
you go for your daytime, or it might be a nighttime constitutional walk, and you, you wonder exactly how to get back, and you stop someone and say, excuse me, you find yourself saying, am I uh, headed for the rocks? <laughs> Question I've asked myself many a time, and on, <laughs> and on many a midnight stroll, but it, only in Sydney do they say, yeah, no worries. <laughs> Good place for dangerous ideas, a chit chat, in other words. Uh, a risk taking kind of a spot. Rocks? No worries. Um, I'm sorry for that reason, uh, to have, or partly for that reason, to have missed your darkness at dawn a moment um, the other day, um, because a lot of my early training in the apocalyptic came from the study of Australian letters. Uh, when I was a boy, I was very fond of the writing of Neville Shute. Um, Town Like Alice, um, I particularly loved, In the Wet, uh, No Highway, remember No Highway? Um, perhaps I'm giving away my age a bit, but, but of course, um, and most, I think most memorably, On the Beach, where the last people on earth wait in Australia to see what kind of death is going to be brought to them on the prevailing winds. There were lots of ways, I now realize, tons of ways in which Neville Shute couldn't write. But he could write about the, uh, the inevitable um, and in, about the, the possibility of extinction. In other words, that nature might not know we were here. Um, the great challenge to our self-esteem, to our solipsism, that there could be a point in evolution where evolution that hadn't noticed we'd arrived wouldn't even notice that we'd gone either. And beautifully done, as some of you will have seen by Stanley Kubrick on the screen, where as the inevitable gets nearer all the time, the churches decide it's time for a moment of uplift. And out come the Salvation Army girls with their tambourines and their tins, and the churches throw open their doors, and there's a big banner saying, repent. Uh, there is still time, brother, it reads. Uh, and it, it mocks what's coming, um, and it doesn't know it's doing it, uh, last attempt to fill up those empty spaces in the church. And at the close, uh, the streets are empty, and it's a dusty, howling wilderness. But the banner, there is still time, brother, is still flapping in the, in the wind to mock all our illusions. And it's the attempt to live without illusions that I believe is the most dangerous, but the most worthwhile, and in some ways the most enjoyable undertaking, despite its risks, of all, and that's why I'm here, and that's why you're nice to have me. Now, um, cosmology is a real bastard in a lot of ways. It's made it ever harder, has been making it ever harder for us to think too highly of ourselves. Ever since Galileo deposed us from our very conceited position, the one we'd chosen for ourselves, of course, um, and had pointed out to us by the comforting church at the center of uh, what was thought of as creation. Uh, now it's almost a commonplace because of the, the knife edge of climatology on which we understand ourselves to live and when we see the rest of our, just our tiny little suburb of a solar system, an unimportant speck in an unimportant suburb of a, of a little known galaxy, just in our neighborhood, every other planet is either too hot to live in or too cold and lots of our planet is one of those or the other, and the rest is on a knife edge, as we've increasingly come to understand. And so the probability of our being here forever is nil, and the possibility that we'll last as long as our planet isn't that great. But suppose we do. Here's something to cheer you up. Um, you thought I came just to make you laugh or just to make you cry? Not a bit of it. Before I'm done, um, um, well, we'll see. Uh, I was at a festival in Hay on Wye. I don't know if you've ever been there, a wonderful town on the English Welsh border where there's now a beautiful annual literary festival a couple of years ago. And one of the speakers was uh, Sir Martin Rees. Sir Martin is the professor of cosmology and astrophysics at Cambridge University. And he's also got the wonderful title of the Astronomer Royal, uh, which even a Republican like myself can imagine wanting to have. Just as I live in Washington, I've never wanted a political job, but if I was to be given grace and favor by the president, it would be the Bureau of Alcohol, Firearms, and Tobacco. 
Anyway, I can't be the Astronomer Royal, but I can quote what Sir Martin said in an extraordinary speech called Dark Materials, which was the Joseph Rotblatt Memorial Lecture. And there was a paragraph in it that completely arrested me. And I'm going to, as they say, share it with you. Um, most educated people, said Sir Martin, are aware that we are the outcome of nearly four billion years of Darwinian selection. But many tend to think that humans are still somehow the culmination of that. Our sun, however, is less than halfway through its lifespan. It will not be humans who watch that sun's demise six billion years from now. Any creatures that then do exist will be as different from us as we are from bacteria or amoeba. I find that an arresting thought, in some ways a depressing one, in some ways an inspiring one. It certainly makes me feel that one uh, mustn't consider evolution uh, as producing us as its last word. That would be a sort of insult to any scientific process. We happen to know that even in the measurable distance of the last few thousand years, that progress is going forward in our brain formation. I think our job is to remain without illusions, integral, intact, keep our planet that way as best we can, and pass it on so that this experiment gets more interesting. Um, and if you'll allow me to say so, what I just quoted to you from Sir Martin, unless I much mistake my audience, is genuinely awe-inspiring. You think of watching, good. Now. I mean, really awe-inspiring, not like seeing a burning bush would be awe-inspiring, for example. <laughs> really awe-inspiring. You think of creatures gradually watching the sun die, and they're not us. And they're as far from us as bacteria our ancestors are from us. If that isn't mind-expanding, if that isn't awe-inspiring, then you don't have the capacity for awe, and you won't be able to get it from a holy book either. <laughs> In other words, it's not a matter of whether you laugh or cry, it's a matter of how you think and what you think. And the realization that comes with it is congruent with many things, I believe, but not with the idea that truth can come from desert revelations made to uh, schizophrenics and epileptics. <laughs> it's a strange thing, isn't it? When you are on a bus now and someone starts talking about how they've got a message from God, I don't know, maybe I'm different. Do you move nearer them? Or <laughs> I thought so. Um, now, Sir Martin, as it happens, is a mild and skeptical, but church-going member of the Anglican Communion. His family's been going to the same church in Cambridge, I think, for a very long time. It's a practice he makes. It doesn't have anything at all to do with his scientific work or beliefs. And why should it? Um, I'm coming now to the point uh, that I warned Tony I wanted to stress, and we're going to talk about later, of the, the famous observation made by Stephen Jay Gould, wonderful biologist and paleontologist, that religion and science are non-overlapping magisteria, as he put it. There's no necessary reason why they should be in conflict. The two ideas can coexist in the same mind. I was a great admirer of Gould's, but I, I think I want to disagree, and here's how. Of course, a great scientist can also be a person of faith. Uh, Joseph Priestley, for example, who more or less discovered oxygen, as we understand it, and whose laboratory was smashed for profanity by monarchist and loyalist mobs in Birmingham and drove him over to Philadelphia. He was a Unitarian, um, a great man of science and the Enlightenment, but he believed in the phlogiston theory. Um, Alfred Russell Wallace, who did most of Darwin's early work for him, not just on selection, but on continental drift as well, working to your near north that you used to call the Far East, um, Indonesia. Um, loved nothing better than spiritualist seances. Um, I really liked a bit of table turning and table wrapping and burblings from the beyond to sweeten his day. Um, the, the greatest scientist Cambridge ever produced, possibly, arguably, um, Sir Isaac Newton, uh, was an alchemist. He kept a furnace permanently going in his rooms, which he several times set fire to, in case he the moment would come when he would work out how to turn lead into gold. Believed that the Catholic Church was the Antichrist, may have been onto something. Um, <laughs> was obsessed with the measurements of the, he thought it would be better to know the, temp, the measurements of the original temple than to find out about gravitational theory. Anyway, a real, but a great scientist. It goes, it, it goes on. 
Um, and there were many brilliant German physicists, rivals and contemporaries of Einstein, working in the same field who believed that there was Aryan science and Jewish science, and there were two different types of physics. So, of course, these things can, can coexist, but it seems to me that they are, it's not a matter of their coexistence or their uh, overlap as to whether or not they are compatible, whether or not they're ultimately reconcilable. For example, this I'm talking now not just about what people think, but about how, um, it was a Catholic, um, not just a Catholic physicist, but actually a man in holy orders, Georges Lemaitre of the University of Louvain, who in the 20s anticipated the idea of the Big Bang, quarreled with Einstein about it, said that he, he didn't call it the Big Bang, that conversation, he thought of it as the, the egg that, from which the universe suddenly burst. Um, and was right, and Einstein had to admit that he was probably the first to get onto this use of the theory of relativity. He took it to the Pope, uh, Pope Pius XI it was, and the Pope was so impressed, being warned that this theory was likely, that he offered to Father Lemaitre, Professor Lemaitre, he said, if, if you like, I'll make it dogma. I'll say that people have to believe it. He said, well, actually, <laughs> very nice of you, Your Holiness, but that would be sort of missing the point of a scientific experiment. <laughs> It's the, that's what I mean by saying this mentality is not congruent, not compatible. It's not really reconcilable. And I think we're going to increasingly have to face this, whether, the, um, whether we're driven by evidence or by um, reasoning. Staying with the macro for a bit, um, uh, one gets asked, you get asked, if you're me, by believers, well, how come there's something and not nothing? It's a very good question. It's actually a very important question. It's asked from the point of view of something, from the point of view of the, the only species we know of anywhere that could ask that question. It looks out onto vast expanses of nothingness, uh, where nothing is happening and where there is no life. And so it is, you have to make the assumption that you are there and that you're able, so you know how all that goes. Uh, it, it, it rather alters the, the question to when it's being asked in that way, but still, it's a good question, but it doesn't have any very helpful answers, or not if you consider, for example, um, Edwin Hubble was the first to notice that Newton was wrong and that the universe is not just expanding away from itself, the red, so-called red light shift at a, a ter terrific speed, but you would expect the speed in Newtonian terms to be the rate of its expansion, I mean to say, velocity, to be declining. To the contrary, Hubble noticed it's speeding up. It's getting faster all the time. All subsequent experiments have shown this. In fact, if we hadn't discovered the Big Bang when we did, and we were trying for it now, examining the red light, some of that evidence would already have blown past us. If you can get your mind around this, as, as around Sir Martin Rees's imagery of uh, cosmic future. As J Professor Haldane used to say, the universe is not just stranger than we imagine, it's stranger than we can imagine, but we know this much, that it's blasting apart very, very fast. A great deal of nothingness is certainly coming to us. There's an enormous amount of nothingness in our future. And even if we aren't prepared to wait for that or to wait for species change to overtake us, we can see already in the night sky the Andromeda galaxy on collision course with our own. That's certainly going to happen. Whether we destroy ourselves or the sun blows up or not before that, probably not. Collision course. Now, is this part of a plan? You suddenly have to ask yourself. Is that part of a plan? If so, whose plan is it? <laughs> that so much nothingness is built right in and is headed straight for us. So anyone who wants to ask the first question has to be willing to consider its corollary question. Um, and the certainty in the second case unlike the first of, a, of an answer. So if you think that all this is going on in these gigantic fields of gravity and light with you in mind, then you really do have a self-centeredness problem. <laughs> you might put it another way. I have tried to put it another way. I'll try it on you. Um, our first uh, speaker tonight said that his people have been around for 100,000 years that we know about. That's certainly true. That we, there is a difference of opinion about how long our species in general has been on the planet. It's a, it's a flash of a second in evolutionary time. 
Um, Richard Dawkins thinks it might be as long as 250,000 years. Let, let, make it a quarter of a million. Francis Collins, the man who did the DNA decoding, the Human Genome Project, who is, by the way, another Christian scientist, or rather, a scientist who is a Christian. Um, I won't make that mistake again. Um, <laughs> You know what Mark Twain said about the work of Mary Baker Eddy, the Christian science writer, founder of it, her books? Chloroform in print. He said. Um, this is a digression. It's a digression. Francis Collins says at least 100,000 years. We can show we've been around for that long. It's quite a long time. I'll take, I'll take 100. Never mind. I don't need a quarter of a million for my point. Make it 100,000. 100,000 years, people have been, our species have been around on, on this spec. Born usually dying, actually, a great number of them in childbirth wouldn't have got beyond being born. For the first 80 or so, 90 or so thousand years, nearly 100, not living more than 25 to 30 years at the most, then probably dying of their teeth, if they were lucky, or of the other needless mammalian things that show us that we bear the stamp, as Darwin put it, of our lowly origin the appendix we don't need anymore, innumerable other shortcomings of our design. We're, we're designed to live on the savanna that we've escaped from. Um, terrible d disease, suffering, misery, malnutrition, and fear. Where do the earthquakes come from? Why is there an eclipse? What are the shooting stars doing? And awful cults of sacrifice to try and ward off what are in fact natural events, and war, and rape, and the kidnap of other peoples, and the enslavement of them. All of this goes on. Gradually, gradually inching up to the point where you can brew beer, a breakthrough in my view, um, <laughs> domesticate animals, separate one kind of corn from another, so very millimetrical progress, but r terrible struggle, sacrifice, pain, misery, and above all, fear and ignorance. And you have to believe this if you believe in monotheism. For the first 97, 98,000 of this, Heaven watches with indifference. Oh, there they go again. <laughs> They've all, this, that whole civilization's just died out. Well, what are you gonna do? <laughs> they're raping each other again. They've, they've, they're poisoning, the, they think that the other tribe has poisoned the well, so they're gonna kill all their children. All this, just watch all that. 3,000 years ago at the most, it's decided, no, we've got to intervene now. You have to believe it. You have to believe it. And the revelation is, must, be, must be personal, must appear. So we'll pick the most backward, the most barbaric, the most illiterate, the most superstitious, and the most savage people we can find in the most stony area <laughs> of, the, of the world. We won't appear to the Chinese, who can already read. We won't appear in the Indus Valley where they know a thing or two and they're already, you know, they're very far of us. No. We'll, we'll appear to this brutal, enslaved, hopeless, superstitious crowd and we'll force them to cut their way through every, all of their neighbors with slaughter, genocide, and racism and settle on the only part of the Middle East where there's no oil. And all subsequent revelations occur in the same district. <laughs> and without this, we wouldn't know right from wrong. <laughs> now. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, comrades and friends, brothers and sisters. <laughs> I know I'm capable of parody and, and in, at my lowest of sarcasm, and I've proved it to you, and sometimes I've got paid for it. But in seriousness now, do I really, do I seriously mi misrepresent the situation? You must believe something like that happened or did not in order to address the whole question of where monotheism comes from. I would say it can't be proved that that isn't how we came to understand um, the, the, the morality and the need for it. But I would regard it in the light of the other evidence I've touched upon as being in the very highest degree improbable. That that is the way we discovered how to think, uh, how to decide how to live with one another, what our duties are uh, to each other, and so forth. And I submit it to you in all 
No, I'm not going to say humility. Um, I just submit it to you, okay? <laughs> and again, if this was the plan, was it made by someone who likes us? Well, that's another question. <laughs> and if so, why have 99.9% .9 of all the other species that have ever been created uh, already died out? And part of what plan was that? You see, if... Uh, it is a plan or a design, and one cannot positively prove that it is not, it only restates the original problem. The planner must be either very capricious, really toying with his, with his creation, very, or very and or very clumsy, very tinkering, and fantastically wasteful. Throw away 99.9% .9 of what you've made. Or very cruel and very callous, or just perhaps very indifferent, or some combination of all the above. And so it's no good saying that he moves in mysterious ways <laughs> or that he has purposes that are opaque to us because even that kind of evasion has to make itself predicate on the assumption that the person saying this knows more than I do about the supernatural. And I haven't yet met anyone who does have a private line to the creator of the, of the sort that would be required even to speculate about it. Um, I've never met, in other words, I've never met anyone in holy orders or out of it who isn't also a primate. <laughs> and neither have you. <laughs> Thus, when the local prince of the church, who I was sorry to miss on Tony's show, Cardinal Archbishop George Pell, um, takes leave to tell me, and he's going to tell you under this roof, uh, that in his own words, without God we are nothing. My reply is, Your Eminence, please don't talk to me in that tone of voice. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not a slave and I'm on the side of anyone who is in their emancipation. And it's the mind-forged manacles that are often the hardest to break. I'm sorry to tell the Cardinal Archbishop, and I wish I could say it to his face, I have to some of his... Uh, colleagues, as you might say, that his, he's wrong twice. He's first wrong in his concept of a deity, as, in other words, as someone without whom we would be nothing. And he's wrong, second, to declare that we are worthless without agreeing with his concept of that concept. And I demand to know how he knows. His eminence is claiming to know more than a primate can possibly know, and he's showing that he knows much less than most primates probably should. <laughs> so if, if someone says to me, and I've heard it in my travels, without the dear leader, we are lost. We are nothing. Um, it used to be said in Italy in the Mussolini period, il duce ha sempre ragione. The leader is always right. Mussolini is always right. Uh, ein Reich, ein Volk, ein Führer. Only, we only need one leader, one people, and um, one regime. All of this has the smack of the totalitarian. And without the leader, we'd be lost. We'd be, have no choice but to commit suicide. I say, we've come this far with Jim. Let's drink it now. <laughs> without him, we're nothing. With most of those sort of invocations, one hears instantly, or, or rather, I would say one smells instantly, the unmistakable reek, stench of the totalitarian temptation. And we, we, we should be armored. It should be innate in us to resist it. And where it isn't, we should learn how to build it up as a matter of survival. Um, but instead, religious morality asks us to overcome doubt, to overcome skepticism, to leave it behind, to suspect the faculty that of ours is the most precious of all, the ability to philosophize, the ability to think for ourselves, the ability to challenge existing authority. No, that's all to be distrusted. That could be a temptation. The evil one, it's not an accident, says that it's the tree of knowledge of good and evil that at all costs you must avoid because anything to do with knowledge could immediately turn uh, profane. So we know nothing about the quantum except that there is such a thing. That's as far as we've got with it now. We know it works. We know if you use it, we can, you can measure an extraordinary number of things to an amazing degree. But we don't know how it works. We don't know about galaxy formation. 
We know a lot about our DNA, but we can't yet use it to cure ourselves. We're miles from doing any of that. We are, I won't, I won't re-emphasize uh, the, the incredible amount we don't any longer, we don't know about the cosmological um, and the uncertainty principles adumbrated by Werner Heisenberg. All we know is that we know much less and less, but at least we know less and less about much more and more. <laughs> so is this a time to say we don't need any further inquiry? All we need is faith in the boss. I would say not. It's just as when I am asked, um, well, rather when the question is put, uh, is there free will? The believer will say yes, uh, because we've been given it. <laughs> of course it's free will. The big guy says so. <laughs> Who am I to disagree? Well, that seems to me to be absolutely self-canceling nonsense. If I say, my answer when I'm asked is, is there free will? I say, yeah, I think there's free will. We have free will. We have no choice. Um, at least I... <laughs> At least I know I'm being ironic. The people, <laughs> the people who say free will, you've got to have it. Um, it's a rule, you've got to have free will. It says, uh, don't even know they're being literal. <laughs> this is the difference between not just the ironic and the literal mind, but between the inquiring and the philosophical, the scientific mind, and the religious one. And that's why they are not just non overlapping, or rather overlapping in a hostile manner, but they're irreconcilable, in my judgment. Um, Socrates, like Jesus, may well not have existed. We don't have any absolute proof. He certainly, like Jesus, didn't write anything down. He only exists for, as a concept in the minds of his followers. I don't mind about that. It, do, I don't, it doesn't bother me because I don't say that he died and my sins were, as a result, forgiven. Or that he didn't really die, so they're forgiven all over again. Except that apparently he's got to come back and die again before, or it's, the whole experiment has to be rerun to be convincing. No, I say what Socrates taught me is exactly that the definition of an educated person is knowing how little they know and being modest and humble in that sense, not in the sense of self abnegation, but saying, please give me the strength to realize that I'm, that I'm only on the first step of a voyage of, of inquiry and discovery. And that method is the one that has set more people free than any faith. Um, against this, again, the prince of the church will tell you, well, again, a rather totalitarian thought, love is compulsory. And you have to love someone who you also are forced to fear, in fact, who you're enjoined to fear. I've always found there's something rather creepy about the idea of compulsory love let alone of someone who is a fear figure. It's a sinister idea, I think, a rather abject idea, a sort of sadomasochistic concept of a relationship. It's a prostrating idea, and it crucially devalues love by making it something that can be extorted or that should be extorted. As well as poisoning the well of intellectual inquiry, it, sort of it taints the wellsprings of our better, our finer emotions. And now I've mentioned poison, I suppose I have to go from the megalo, well, macro, megalo if you, if you like, to the micro, to this very simple question that we're stuck with, and I must not trespass too much on the time I have with the, um, the Reverend Jones, uh, but take the simplest case about whether our, whether our morality is innate or not. Um, and every time I'm asked this question, if you didn't believe in God, how would you know what was good and what wasn't? Every time I'm asked to speak on this, the daily news allows me to give a different answer, and give a different example. Um, take the simplest case of what I believe is innate, our instinct for our children. You don't have to be a parent to have this. Uh, you see a, ch a child trying to rush into the traffic. If you're not a parent, something tells you what you probably ought to be doing about it. Um, the care and love and protection of children is instinct in us, in, that, in fact, in many other species too that don't claim to be divinely ordered around. Um, <laughs> it's something we all share without having to have it explained to us. We may say that, we, um, that those who don't have it, the psychopaths who don't seem to have it or who take delight in breaking this, this uh, commandment or rule, uh, we say that they're bestial, but again, I refer you to 
the animal kingdom that doesn't allow such transgressions. Now, our whole culture is currently being convulsed, rightly, I think, over an offence committed more than three decades ago against a woman, young woman of 13, a girl of 13, by a famous man um, who was stupid enough to try and sue Vanity Fair and thus incurred my curse and displeasure. <laughs> uh, it's good that, all this, that such an argument could go on for so long, I think, legally and morally, because it shows that individual rights are paramount too, just as it was right that France should convulse itself and suspend all other business until the question of Captain Alfred Dreyfus had been settled one way or another. It shows not just that justice is important, uh, but that the individual is the only unit of currency in which this kind of thing can be discussed. Now, the, the very best I found you can say in Mr. Polanski's defense would be that there was some kind of sick complicity involved, that either the girl or her ambitious parents or the general context of permissiveness or something of the sort gave him the feeling that it was probably okay or not that bad to give her a muscle relaxing drug as well as some booze. And then don't ask yourself why he wanted her muscles relaxed, please. Because then you'll have to read the court transcript and you'll find out. Um, and it's pretty horrifying, horrifying. And I think people are quite right to be instinctively outraged, to think, no, if I can think of the worst thing I've ever done, you're already thinking of it. The thing about yourself you'd least like to have generally known, complete silence. <laughs> Very satisfying. Um, <laughs> most of you, I imagine, are thinking, yeah, but I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't. And, and I won't, no one needs to tell me why I wouldn't have either. So that's all I want to say about that, but I'm much more outraged currently by what happened not three decades ago, but three weeks ago to Miss Fazia Youssef, a Yemeni girl who died in childbirth in a hospital in Yemen, hemorrhaging to death, trying to give birth to an already dead baby, the result of her having been married, compulsorily but legally, at the age of 11. That's what happened to Fazia Youssef on our watch she died in childbirth, trying to give birth to a dead baby, husband three times her age, who was legally married to her, as uh, it's estimated one quarter of the young womanhood of Yemen already is. Married at the very, very latest by the age of 15. And though there have been moves in the Yemeni parliament to raise the age at which a young lady may be betrothed, these moves have been blocked even as recently as last September after this outrage by a political party, which um, I will not tell you the name of this political party, but it is not the Yemeni Secular Party. <laughs> in, uh, in Iran, the age of... Uh, consent doesn't come up, by the way, because there is no consent to any sex outside marriage in Islamic society in any case, and many, many kinds of it are punishable by, by death. But the age at which a young girl may be married was moved up finally. The Islamic Revolution put it back to nine, I think it was moved up to 11, which you might say was progress of a kind. Now, you see, this isn't just uh, backward countries we're talking about. And let's not beat about the bush. The Prophet Muhammad was betrothed to his favorite wife, Aisha, when she was six. It wasn't thought fit that he could marry her then in the full sense of the term, and, but he put it off till she was nine. And across a vast swathe of the world, worse things than Roman Polanski has even thought of doing are done as a matter of law and of course, and in the name of, no, not in the name of, but because of the preachings of God's anointed. And then the religious turn to you and you say, secularism must mean moral relativism. Your ethics are situational. And I say, well, let's just hear that again. Because given that I've taken the simplest moral baseline it's possible to take, the protection of defenseless children, isn't it true that all the leading religions of the world are Abrahamic? Yes, we love to stress it. We adore to say that we have all this wonderful multicultural thing in common. And what was Abraham most famous for, apart from having a wife who had a baby when she was 101, which is a, 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 an advance over dying in childbirth when you're 11, <laughs> having been raped probably by a close male relative, if you really want the truth. Apart from that, Abraham's most famous for saying, if God wants me to kill my boy, of course I will. And the only difference between the monotheisms is that some say it was Isaac and some say it was Ishmael. I don't particularly care. But there, but there are annual festivities uh, on the part of the faithful to say, we wish we too 
were capable of such faith. And we, we want to beat our breasts in sympathy with those who are. Why do the Jewish people blow the ram's horn, the shofar? Because the shofar symbolizes the ram who is sacrificed instead. The blood sacrifice is the main thing. And there has to be a child involved. This seems to me to be disgraceful. And, that, and, what, and what's taken for granted that goes with it, because it was practiced on Isaac too in the form of a covenant and imitated by others, the genital mutilation of the young to seal the pact with God, to say nothing matters to me, not the life or health or bodily integrity of my child, never mind that. What has to be proved is without God I am nothing. I'll kill for it and I'm, I'm not just willing to say that, I'm willing to prove it and I'm willing to use my children's bodies as the theater of this enactment of faith. Well, civilization in my submission, ladies and gentlemen, begins where that evil nonsense leaves off and we have to advance the time when more and more people will be able to civilize themselves by outgrowing religion and leaving this awful uh, nonsense behind. And with that, <laughs> and with that, I think I've realized that if you haven't copped my drift by now, I might as well go and sit in that chair anyway. Very nice of you to come, thank you. Have a quick drink of water while you yes, can. Now, um, it's uh, like your book. How many minutes was that, by the way? I'd just like to yeah, know I think if I guessed it right. I think it was 38. Okay. I cheated them of seven minutes. That's all right. We can talk. But I yield back the balance of my time, as they say in the Senate. <laughs> Let's start, if we can, with a, a portrait of the um, artist as a young contrarian. And I'd like to know, did you ever, as a, as a young man or a boy, actually have any religious faith? Um, I, I'm terrified that someone here might have bought my book <laughs> and have read my answer to that question. If you haven't, by the way, it's available at fine bookstores. <laughs> um, I'll, make it, I'll make it quick, but I, I, I never did. Uh, I think a lot of people have the same experience as me. I, I, was not, I wasn't maltreated by any faith or any church or anything like that. Um, I didn't have a reverse Damascus of losing my faith. What I did was more like discover that I didn't believe. I think probably there are a fair number of people here who know what I'm talking about, who had the same experience. Um, the way I discovered it was this. I had a, a nice teacher called Mrs. Watts, an old trout, um, <laughs> when I was at a boys' school in Devonshire. And I must have been about 10. And she was our nature teacher, nature walks. Come on, boys, show you different kinds of tree, flower. I used to know the difference. Um, <laughs> bird, um, that sort of thing. Um, but she was also our scripture teacher. Uh, I used to enjoy scripture lessons because it was my first... I didn't know this, but it was my first um, work as a literary critic. I was going through, <laughs> well, well, no, it was called Search the Scriptures. They'd give you a text on a piece of gummed paper that the government would send, because it was we're an officially Anglican country, the, my country of birth. Um, the Queen is the head of the church as well as the state. You know all this, and the armed forces. I hope she has a long life, if only because the moment she checks out her bat-eared, chinless, <laughs> resentful, Islam-fancying son will become the head of the church and the head of the state and the armed forces at that instant, which is what you get if you found a regime on the family values of Henry VIII. <laughs> but I digress again. Um, so the government would send these papers out, and you'd be given one, and gum it in your little book, and it would give a, a chapter and a verse, and you'd have to look that up and say what led up to and what led away from this verse. So the, they wouldn't give you the story, just the verse, and you'd have to tell of what story or parable uh, this verse was the culmination. Really well worth doing and taught you to do some close textual analysis. Um, one day Mrs. Watts made a fatal mistake and she, she tried to combine her scripture teaching with her nature teaching. And she said, swept away by faith, she said, and boys, you notice how 
beautiful the greenery is, the, the trees, the fields, the shrubs, the leaves, all, they're lovely shades of green, which you say is amazing because it's the color that's the most restful and lovely to our eyes. So God must be very good because imagine if he'd made the leaves and the grass orange or, or purple or something really clashing and, and horrible to the eyes. But he didn't, he made it green, which is much nicer. And I thought, I was 10, I thought, that's bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know, I didn't know anything about chlorophyll, say, then, <laughs> or photosynthesis. In fact, I don't know that much about it now, or phototropism, or natural selection, or anything. I didn't know anything like that, and that no one had ever told me that it might not be true what was in the Bible, so, but I thought, no, no this, that's absolute nonsense. It's obvious to me. I knew the, uh, the eyes came after the trees. The, the natural uh, vegetation had been there before the human eye was. How I knew this, I don't know, but I did know it. Um, turns out to be true. Um, <laughs> and I could never get over it. I started to notice more and more uh, discrepancies and um, uh, absurdities. And you know how it is, you can't be a little bit heretical. Um, that's partly why I favor compulsory religious instruction in schools. <laughs> because I know of no other way to guarantee the steady mass production of atheism among, <laughs> among the young. Do you know, it, it never occurred to me when I asked that question, it was an invitation to recite the first chapter. No, well, there you go. But uh, you've, you've done so you want, The you've hard done copy so is still fine paperback version. <laughs> Listen, uh, God is not great. I mean, you can tell, and everyone here can tell, that uh, your use of language is mesmerizing. The book is a, is a polemic, and as such, it's quite intoxicating as well, I think. But for this conversation, I've been looking for the flaws in your argument, and here's what I think the main one is. Um, you've exposed every conceivable facet of religion's capacity for evil, but you've made virtually no admissions at all about its capacity for good. So, I wonder why you refuse to do that. Well, I thought there were enough books making that point. <laughs> um, so, I would write one stressing the dark side of it, if you like. But I'm not going to pretend I don't know what you mean. I mean, it's, it is another question that I know, I always know I'm going to be faced with, so I don't think I, I duck it so much as to try and anticipate it. My, the way I've resolved this, to try and make it um, condense, is this. Um, you have to point out to me, I've tried this with quite leading theologians and members of various religions and important clerical spokesmen. I said, you give me an example of a moral action taken or a moral statement made by a believer because of their faith that I couldn't make as a person who doesn't have faith. And I have not so far had anyone point such a thing out to me except the... the um, um, well, let me come to that in a second, because uh, I haven't yet had a convincing answer offered. But the corollary question is this, can you name me a wicked action undertaken or a wicked statement made by someone purely because of their religion, and you've already thought of one? Everyone here can think of one right away. And you've thought of another one, too, now you're thinking about it. <laughs> to answer my own question, um, I, I was once told, well, I've thought of something. It's a statement, and I said, okay, tell me. And it was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And I said, yes, but I, by definition, couldn't make that statement. For obvious reasons. I mean, I, I'm not in the position of having such a father or being able to uh, make such an appeal to him. So it isn't, it isn't something I'm forbidden to do by faith. It's something no Christian could say either. Uh, but it was a good try. I have come up with a remark, uh, because I try very hard to to argue against myself. And um, it came to me the other day that Lech Wałęsa, during the early struggle of the Solidarity Movement in Poland, was interviewed as the shipyards were being surrounded by the Polish militia and army, and his little band of, of resistors and dissidents was in there with the, with the hard, fairly hard core of the Polish working class around it, but a perilous situation. And he was asked by an interviewer, aren't you scared, aren't you afraid? And he said, with complete composure, he said, I'm not afraid of anyone but God. And I thought, well, I think that's a nonsensical statement, but I think it's a very noble one, and I wouldn't be able to make it. Um, 
It is a bit contextual, however. That was the favorite statement of General Edwin Walker, the right-wing crackpot who was the founder of the John Birch Society in the United States as well. The man who Lee Harvey Oswald practiced assassination on, in fact, first try. Um, dry run, you might say. Um, but I, I, I would have to say I'm, a, I'm aware of what a statement like that can mean to people. Well, indeed, In the same way as I'm aware of what a stained glass window or a psalm or um, a mosque can mean to people that, alas, it can't mean to me. Indeed. And there is a passage in your book, actually. I mean, you, you say that you can't think of something that you couldn't have done, a moral action that you couldn't have done without having religion. Fair enough. But you do, in your book, single out on one occasion, it seems to be the closest you come to praising anybody who is overtly religious. It's Dr. Martin Luther King and what inspired him. And you write about the placards that appeared at his rallies carrying the words, I am a man, yes. carried by itinerant black workers. And I'm just wondering whether you can't well, see... Well, not itinerant, it's the, the, the most ground-down garbage workers in Memphis. Yeah. yeah, okay. But can you not see in that the capacity for good in religion, because everything that he said and did was based upon biblical teaching. Um, it, it, what I go on to say is that that's precisely not the case. You see, the Taylor Branch's biography of him, following his king's own um, biblical annexations, uh, the first volume is called, I think, um, The Pillar of Fire. Uh, the second volume is called The Parting of the Waters. The third is called Crossing the Jordan. Um, it's all, the image is that of the exodus from slavery. But I say in my book, and I'll repeat, because I never tire of doing so, um, <laughs> why it's a very good thing that Dr. King isn't basing himself on the biblical. Because if he was, he'd be telling his followers, you have the right to kill anyone who gets in your way, and to enslave them, and to take their women as your concubines, and to murder the, their children, and to steal their land. That's what the children of Israel are told they can do by way of the first five or so books of the uh, Bible. Except Dr. King would probably now, tell King, you that he drew his inspiration from parts of the Sermon on the Mount, uh, well, which is considered the main source of Christian pacifism. Yes, but he's the, 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 the stuff he talks about is, going, is Moses going to the mountaintop. Indeed, I say, I think what, it is the most moving speech he makes is the night before he dies or is murdered. He says, I've been to the mountaintop and I know I'm not going to see Canaan. Uh, it's, it's far enough for me. I've seen all I, all I have to. And it's, it's eerie watching it, because you know what he doesn't, which is he isn't going to make it. He's, he's, in fact, he's not going to make it to sunset the next day. As it happens, it was a favorite speech of his. He, ma he made it on dozens of occasions. It was part of his repertoire. It's less, a little less eerie when you know that. But I just say I'm very glad that Moses was not, in fact, his mentor, because if so, King would have been a bloodthirsty, conquering, racist and slave monger, which it's a good thing he wasn't. Uh, the, great dis the great problem with the King legacy is this. It's meant that for every school child in America, the legacy of black secularism in the civil rights movement has been completely abolished. The people who actually organized the March on Washington, A. Philip Randolph, for example, fantastic black trade union leader, um, Bayard Rustin, a brilliant black socialist intellectual, the people who actually did it. And, Philip Randolph proposed the first march in Washington during the years of Franklin Roosevelt. All these people are, are gone. And it's the prevailing view among most white liberals that black people only really respond to preachers. And as a result, an enormous number of black frauds have been foisted on the population. As long as they can get the word reverend in front of their name. Jeremiah Wright, um, Jesse Jackson, uh, the Al Sharpton, I mean, you know, Chaucerian frauds um, of the lowest kind. Everyone thinks, well, they must be okay because these black guys, they sure love them some, some ministers. I, I'll, I'll, can I, it's not a good thing. Christopher, I'll, I'll, I'll press you on this point. Please. I'll press you on this point because uh, your argument is if he was to take biblical texts, he would have got his followers to turn their swords upon their oppressors. But if he actually took his moral compass, if his moral compass was in fact uh, based upon the Sermon on the Mount, based upon the Beatitudes, it would be turn the other cheek, love your enemy as yourself, blessed are the peacemakers. These are things you don't mention at all in your book, and yet they did inform his teachings. Um, just a second on the oppressors. Um, 
Moses wasn't telling his followers that they could kill their oppressors. He was saying that they could kill anyone who got in their way. That's why we don't run into any Amalekites anymore, for example. <laughs> and he explicitly said, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not a pacifist. If Martin Luther King had said to his people, you have the right to rebel and resist and use violence against racism, I would have been absolutely with him, um, as I have been on other occasions when that's been the case. Uh, but he would, you know, to be, to be consistent, he had to say, no, we, can, we have the right to enslave people. And we have the right to commit genocide. That's what the biblical precedent would be. As for the Beatitudes, that, that is, it seems to me, pacifism in its strictly immoral sense. It says it's wrong to resist evil. I don't think that's true. I think it's immoral to say that you shouldn't resist evil. Let's go back to the general proposition that... And by the way, to say you love your neighbor as yourself is what I mean by compulsory love. Um, it's a very sinister injunction. You cannot possibly love another person in the, same, in the same way as you love, say, your lover or your family, or let alone, in my case at any rate, yourself. Um, <laughs> it's asking too much. The golden rule says, the, it's asking too much, and, it's, and, and that's, not just, that's not all that's wrong with it. It's asking too much, and it's guaranteeing that you will fail, and therefore that you'll have to feel constantly guilty for your shortcomings. It's, it's demanding the impossible for you on pain of hell fire. This is not a good thing. It's not good for the morals either. The golden rule, demand for yourself, oh sorry, demand, expect for, demand of others, the self-respect that you would demand for yourself. That's fine. That's doable, it's hard, but it's feasible. Um, it has a contradiction in it, a big trap door actually, which you can ask me about if you like. But at least it's not immoral, and not, but it's not Christian. It comes, it's, it appears that the idea of the golden rule, do unto others as you'd like to be treated yourself. It appears in the Analects of Confucius. It's in the Babylonian Talmud. We don't know of any society that didn't have some such commonsensical morality. Okay, uh, uh, look, uh, religion gets its morality from us. We don't get our morality from religion. Since you, since you uh, kept going on the point, uh, mm. let, me, let me go back to King just for a moment because the assumption uh, that he never was influenced by the New Testament. Seems. No, I didn't say that. Okay. I say that his main narrative was Exodus. Um, of course he was a Christian. But you also say his most imperative... He was a Lutheran, his, so... His, he most, his most imperative teaching was that of nonviolence. Now, if that didn't come from the Beatitudes, where did it come no, from? No, no, I'm saying it did, but I'm saying that's not moral to me. That's not moral teaching. There are two things wrong with the Beatitudes. One is the idea of non-resistance. Um, the other is the idea of loving, of compulsory love uh, to an impossible degree. I don't think these are moral preachments. I think they're fanatical preachments made by the same person who said, take no thought for the morrow, uh, no, don't care about clothing or investment or education or any of these things, just drop everything and follow me, that's moral. A mad preaching it means you don't care about your children's education, you don't care about building a house, you don't care about uh, thrift, um, about investment, about husbandry, any of these things. Why? Because the world's going to come to an end. That's what the preacher was saying and meaning. These things are all pointless. The world is going to come to an end. You're going to be around when it comes to an end. It'll happen in your lifetime. So throw everything away. For the very disastrous apocalypticism that I began tonight by trying to criticize. But King's nonviolence worked. Well, it worked in, he was lucky, I think, because there was... You would um, have preferred the other way around, though, that he urged his followers to take up the sword. I would have, if it hadn't, if what he'd tried the first time hadn't worked, if it had been resisted much longer, um, they were going to take up, if not the sword, they were going to resort to violence. They indeed a lot of the time did, and every negotiation uh, with the uh, Dixiecrat, a very highly organized violent reaction, was conducted with the knowledge that they had, not theoretical either, practical, that if we don't negotiate with this guy, there are some much rougher guys we will have to be dealing with. So there was the believable threat of violence behind the non-violence. But as it happens historically, the United States couldn't postpone the question of civil rights any longer. And um, it had become a big issue in the Cold War, a big embarrassment to the United States in the Cold War. Um, there was a, probably a majority among at least northern whites in favor of emancipation. Um, there hadn't been any mass immigration to the United States for a very long time. 
uh, there was no further excuse to put it off. It was really a case of the right man at, at the right hour. But that's, that's a relativistic point, isn't it? Let's go back to um, the general proposition. But the struggle for civil rights would have occurred <laughs> whether there was, uh, whether there had been a Christian revelation or not. I mean, the, the American Anti-Slavery Society, for example, was largely begun by people um, who were of no faith, people like uh, Thomas Paine and Benjamin Franklin. Um, the likelihood that you'd be a secularist in favor of civil rights would be extremely high, almost 100%. The likelihood that you'd be an opponent of civil rights and be a Christian, roughly 100% the other way. Um, remember, the, the whole mandate for slavery and segregation is taken directly from the Bible, where it is warranted. Remember, the Ku Klux Klan is a Protestant identity organization. It's a specifically, uh, declaredly, avowedly uh, Christian Protestant group. Um, if, if people are going to say that biblical inspiration is allowed, how are they going to say it's only allowed in their own case? Let's go back to the general proposition that religion poisons everything. And you do tend to argue by analogy, anecdote, and example. So let me do the same thing mm -hmm. here if I can. A lot, like a lot of Australians, I've actually spent a good deal of time uh, taking trips to the island of Bali over the years. And uh, I simply find it impossible to imagine that Bali would be a better place if stripped of its religion. So I'd ask you just to, to talk to that, because you know, to me it's an incredibly appealing place precisely because the rhythms of life are maintained by a religious calendar and by strict adherence to principles. Yes, um, I've been to Bali too, uh, though mainly to <laughs> investigate. I don't, know, I don't know if you realize that's a song, but you probably do. Um, but mainly to investigate um, religious thuggery in my case, and I went partly out of solidarity to that Australian bar in uh, Denpasar, Paddy's. Mm -hmm. uh, Paddy's Pub Reloaded, as it was called by them, um, where all the worst actions on the island were conducted by people of faith. But I do, I guess, know what you mean. There are those who say that these Eastern practices aren't really religions. I mean, they, it's said of Buddhism, for example, that it isn't one. Um, I have, I'm in two minds about this. Most Buddhists claim that they're not religious. It's not a God business. It's a, it's a, a spiritual practice, if you like. Well, in Bali, 95% of the people roughly adhere to what they call the Hindu Dharma. Yes. It's a blend of Hinduism, Buddhism, and yes. ancestor worship. Yes. Um, to not call that a religion is stretching the point. Um, no, I agree. I mean, it's, it's more like, it, it seems to me, uh, more like a culture or a practice. I mean, it, what... Um, what, do, what threats do they make against non-believers? Um, we don't know. I mean, it's very, also very highly evolved. When you say, it's a bit like asking me, can I imagine um, England, my country of birth, or, okay, anywhere else in Europe without cathedrals? No, I can't. I absolutely can't. Or rather, if I try, I don't, I don't like the idea. Yes, but the difference is that 95% uh, of the population don't worship in those cathedrals, whereas in Bali, people's lives are controlled and run along this religious clock. Yes. Um, you know, there are, it's the harvest. Yeah. There, are yeah, even, there are even ways of worshipping your vehicles, your machinery. Sure. Silly, but probably harmless. I guess <laughs> what, I, what I say... You wouldn't like to see it gone, though, would you? No. What I say in my, in my, in my introduction is that all of that and more, for better and worse, I don't... It's not I don't mind. I mean, how, how tolerant can I get? How nice do you want me to be? It's not... It's just a... I, I, may, I may dislike it very much, but I, I, won't, I, I don't expect people to give it up or want them to. I, I insist only that they leave me out of it, okay? that I don't have to know what they believe, <laughs> that, they don't, that they don't want a subsidy from the government for it, that they don't try and teach it to my children, that they don't expect me uh, to uh, have to live under it in any way, then that's all absolutely fine. But, uh, therefore, for me, the test of religion is, in, in a way, whether it proselytizes or not. And it seemed to me in Bali that if there ever was a time when they did that, they'd given it up. But I'm sure there was a time of terrible spiritual and religious warfare in that part of the world. It can't have been the only part of the world where there never was. The Balinese actually ran from a, an Islamic invasion. That's uh, yeah, why well, they exist. I mean, there's that too. But I mean, I bet among, between different Buddhist and Hindu groups, there have been terrible episodes of homicide and worse. Uh, there are some parts of the world where they've calmed down and got over it. But uh, it doesn't entitle us to forget what religion was like when it thought it could get away with it. Okay. But, I mean, anyway, my, my, my principle is absolutely one of coexistence and even of 
cultural admiration, as long as the fangs are drawn. And if you say they've been drawn in Bali, good on them. It, it's just, it, it just sort of goes against the idea that religion poisons everything, which is no, your, your basic point. Your, now, perhaps your, it's a rhetorical your, Well, point. you're describing a culture and praising it, as far as I know justly, to, to precisely the extent to which it doesn't resemble really a religion. Now, is that me having it both ways? <laughs> I mean... It, it, certainly, it certainly resembles, a, get, it certainly what, resembles a religion to me, what and you, I would yes. say probably to the majority of the Balinese people. But what, if you get, what, do you get if you, what do you get if you cross a Jehovah's Witness with a Unitarian? Someone who comes and knocks on your door for no particular reason. <laughs> Unitarians are religious too. They, they say the, their apparent belief is one God at the most. Um, they don't. I don't have any. I don't have the, the. I don't have the energy for real quarrel with them. But I mean, I don't. I don't terrifically respect it either. As long as all I ask is that it leaves me alone. Let's bring the principle closer to home and to our home here. I mean. Um, Let's look at another example. There's a, a place called the Oasis here in Sydney. It's a shelter for uh, young homeless people. It was a subject of a very moving documentary not so long ago. And from that, it's clear that the heart and soul of this place is a Salvation Army captain uh, called Paul Moulds and his wife. Now, they're non-judgmental as far as I can see. They don't seem to be pushing their religion. Essentially, they practice their faith by helping others. So can that be poisonous? No, but in what sense in that case is it religious? Again, you're saying, these people are so nice, they're hardly religious at all. <laughs> you're making... No, I, no what I'm, you, what you, I'm, you what took, I'm you saying You took care is, to pick an example where yeah. their faith had nothing to do with... No, no, we're not mentioning any of that. It's not clear at all. We just, like, we just like running orphanages. Now, I'll just tell you something. Most people of faith who like running orphanages aren't that nice. And I know that uh, Australia is one of the places where I don't need to underline that. So again, if you're going to accept or claim the one, you have to take on the other. Whereas, I'll give you an example. Um, I like giving blood, okay? It's not that I th think I should, and that I was brought up in the idea of the National Health Service, but I actually positively enjoy it. Um, <laughs> more than shedding it. Um, I find it a pleasurable, relaxing experience, and I, I, give pleasure, I get pleasure from the idea that the National Health Service, or wherever I am, isn't going to run out of blood. And I don't lose a pint, because I regrow it quite quickly, but someone else gets one. I like that. There's a great book by an old socialist called Peter Titmus called The Gift Relationship, about how people like to help, and they get positive benefit to themselves from helping other people. And I also have a very rare blood group indeed. And I want to make sure that when it's my turn to hemorrhage, there's enough blood <laughs> around the place. <laughs> Why make a strenuous thing of it? I don't say, and by the way, vote for my party now, or come over to my team or so. No, I've just, I've just done a good thing for its own sake. How about that? Okay. And, the sake in, and the sake includes my own. And we are, it is the human species we're talking about. As a, as a test of your principle, then, and I'm going right back to where we started here because you went on a bit of a tangent, but uh, just sticking to these, sticking to these people, uh, to you, sticking to Captain Moulds and his wife, just for a moment, I yes. mean, they are people of faith. That is what drives them to do what they do 24 hours a day. Okay, they're, they're not proselytizing. Right. And perhaps that's the thing that for you, for you lets them off the hook. But in fact, they are still religious, and they are evidently doing something good. So I'm simply saying your principle doesn't hold up in that case. Well, I don't know enough about them to be sure about that. <laughs> Not trying to be funny. I, I, I just I don't know. But I mean, if, if there's a motive apart from for its own sake, then I would be inclined to suspect it, however ostensibly sweet they were. Yes, I would say that. If there's a hint of proselytization, if, if they're so careful to point out they're not doing it, I wonder why they're so keen to disclaim something. Um, I don't. I, I just don't words know. In their mouth. But they're I mean, you know, I give I give my money to charities like Médecins Sans Frontières mm -hmm. or Am Amnesty International that go and help my fellow creatures without any uh, supernatural um, inducement or consideration. 
Okay, this sort of brings us back to, uh, and we talked about this the other night, but it brings us back to why people seek solace in religion. The killer quote, of course, came from Karl Marx. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of the heartless world, just as it is, just as it is the spirit of a spiritless situation. Yes. I mean, it's interesting he said it so clearly and so well. Uh, and doesn't that sort of at least demonstrate why it's still today in existence? Well, and to complete the quotation, which um, is from the, his, the introduction to his um, critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, he goes on to say, um, criticism of religion has, uh, is necessary um, not, uh, sorry, criticism has plucked the flowers from the chain, uh, not so that um, men may wear the chain without consolation, but so that they may break the chain and cull the living flower. So what Marx is saying is, if, of course it's a consolation and it, it arises from a deep spiritual hunger, but it's false consolation. It's not, it's not the friend it claims to be, and it's always vulgarly misrepresented, as Marx having said that religion was an opiate of the people, that it was a mere narcotic, a, a ruling class uh, drug uh, scam, which it's of course not, it's self-generating. And it comes, I think, not just from unhappiness or loneliness, or what was sometimes in that same uh, discussion called alienation, but from a need that we would have, no matter what the material circumstances were, um, for what I would say the numinous would be one word, the transcendent would be another, the things that we, we know about without being able to quantify them, music, uh, love, landscape for a lot of people, I think, um, t different times of day, uh, some combinations of all those things. Um, the nocturne. Um, I wouldn't trust anyone who was, who was turned deaf on these things. But I think the, the, the great intellectual and, and in some ways um, cultural task is to satisfy hungers of this kind um, artistically um, and aesthetically without them becoming the pretext for superstition um, or empowering the supernatural or anyone who wants to build power on that. And I don't think it's too much to ask. There are many people, I mean, this building is in a way a testimony to it. It's not a cathedral exactly, but it's where people can come uh, for music and for a sense of there being something higher and finer than the everyday. Uh, but it doesn't gratify uh, any cult or any, um, any, <clears throat> any ambition that has supernatural, uh, well, that exploits the supernatural for what are unfortunately rather crudely material purposes. Marx thought he had the answer, um, but your appeal here to higher values and so on is interesting, and the question is whether it really will happen. I mean, and the question is whether we've gone from dialectical materialism to plain old materialism, and whether that's all that's gonna be left when you take away or strip away religious thought. Well, um, I was asked this question earlier um, on this visit. Well, I'm, I'm asked it quite a lot, say, you know, the, the alternative is the world of McDonald's and um, condoms and pointless uh, tourism and pleasure seeking and empty hedonism and so forth. I, I fail to see the force of this critique uh, in two ways. One is, if you, if, you, if you really look at the intestinal life of any religion, you'll find it's extremely earthy and materialistic. Um, are you going to really tell me that the Catholic Church lives on spirituality? Um, even just look at the outlines of its prelates. Um, just look at the, look at its finances. Look at the, the it, it's pretty gross. Uh, look at look at what the how the Islamic Republic of Iran actually conducts business. It's a racket. It's a shameful, obvious racket, which includes, by the way, dealing in things and profiting from things, like child prostitution and, and narcotics. Look at how the Taliban finances itself. These so-called ascetics and self-sacrificing suicidal visionaries. It's a crime family. Is what it is. That's the first thing. I've never met a church that isn't completely in, in and of the material world and can't, wouldn't yield to that analysis. Second, and I tried a bit of this in my, my shorter address, um, if you don't think that contemplating, say, the work of Einstein 
or Edwin Hubble um, or Stephen Hawking uh, doesn't have something of the transcendent and the numinous to it, I, then I, I feel sorry for you. It's almost at some point, it's almost ecstatic uh, what they're, what they're talking about. The, the, the sheer beauty of the natural world, uh, the, what I call the awe-inspiring character of, of physics. Uh, this, this, this is really magnificent, it's marvelous. It deserves almost to be called miraculous. Um, who here knows what I mean by the event horizon? I, well, I couldn't see you if you did, but I'm, and by the way, I don't really know either, but here's how Hawking, he's such a brilliant writer about science, this is how he describes it. So the event horizon is the lip of the black hole. It's the, the, the uh, aperture itself. Um, if you could travel to it in some way and you could get to the edge of the black hole, get to the little black hole, you'd be at the event horizon. And if you could fall in, be pulled into it, you'd be able to see in some way the past as well as the future. Except, of course, you wouldn't have time. Um, <laughs> there's always something, but uh, there's a, 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 a... Contemplate that for a bit. It's not McDonald's. Um, and in fact, one of Hawking's friends says to him that if he himself were ever diagnosed with a terminal illness, and if he could arrange to go of his own volition, that's how he would want to do it. Um, so no, it's, uh, if, it's the same as the people who say uh, that uh, other forms of totalitarianism, not explicitly theocratic, are secular. Um, an, an argument that keeps on annoying me, and you'll probably want to return to it, but just for now I'd say, <laughs> well, because I never don't get asked, but I just say, well, I'm on this particular aspect of it. To say, um, to have this argument fairly, you'd have to point to a society not that had been Stalinized or Nazified or something of this sort, but that was based on the, on the veneration of, veneration of, respect for, study of, um, Voltaire, Lucretius, Einstein, um, Galileo, Spinoza, possibly the greatest ethicist there ever was, uh, Bertrand Russell, Thomas Jefferson, so on. You'd have to find a society where those were these sort of, if you, if you like, the moral and philosophical authorities, and, and f see how that society had degenerated into slavery, cannibalism, starvation, purges, and witch hunts. And that experiment, alas, we have not yet run. But that's the one I would propose. It's, it's odd uh, when I think about it. It's, uh, it's really odd, in fact, that I chose to do this as a devil's advocate uh, interview. But uh, let's leave that aside. Oh, you, no, wait, wait, I'm sorry, I have to now. Um, I was asked by... <laughs> Oh, no. It's an anecdote. Not chapter it's 10. An, it's, no, it's an anecdote. I was asked... Oh, no, not chapter 10 again. Please, sir, not that. Um, in case you don't know and haven't got the damn book yet, and I'm not sure it's even... In, it's not in there yet, but um, I was asked by the Vatican to testify against the sainthood uh, nomination of Mother Teresa, against initially her beatification, and I said yes. Of course. Um, <laughs> I was very... Oh, I was very honoured to be asked, and... Yes, Your Holiness, the first time I've ever said that, uh, and the last as well. So I, I went to testify, and I made a discovery that I, I thought I'd share with you. Um, everyone used to think they knew one thing about the Catholic Church, whether they were Catholics or not, that in sainthood arguments they have a devil's advocate, advocatus diaboli. And it was true until very recently. The last pope scrapped this office. The office doesn't exist any longer. Uh, it was partly so he could fast-track sainthood. He, he made more saints, the last pope did, than his ten predecessors combined in double. So the Avocados de Abelai office was shut down, no longer is there. Um, so I had to testify just in a seminar room with a monsignor and a deacon and a priest and a tape recorder and a Bible. And I realized halfway through that I'd just become the first person in history to have represented the devil pro bono. <laughs> 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 Okay. Which is a distinction of a sort. <laughs> you took us in the, into the realms of cosmology a short time ago. Here's another quote from your book. Religion has run out of justifications thanks to the telescope and the microscope. I mean, you're simply arguing that... It's a bit simplistic, that, isn't it? Yes, it is a bit. <laughs> but you are simply arguing that science has killed off religion. Is that right? Um, I'm saying I think it's incompatible with... It, it, it's the two ways of thinking as well as the two modes of discovery that follow. Um, are incompatible with it, ir irreconcilable, 
Yes, I do think so. But it's a bit, it's a bit crude to say that um, the microscope and the telescope alone will do it. I was thinking more about how, what we found out about our own human nature, namely the microscope. We know, we know a lot more about what, what makes us morally and ethically the way we are and what, what our kinship is with the lower animals as well. Um, and the, from the telescope, we know more about the origins of our cosmos. It, it's a shorthand for what I was trying to enlarge upon this evening. Yep, the we problem might have is, to revisit that. The, the problem is uh, there are going to remain fundamental questions which science almost certainly will never answer. For example, if the origin of the universe was the Big Bang, what caused that to happen? How could the entire universe simply pop into existence magically for no reason at all? I mean, because science won't be able to answer those questions, religion will always seek to. Well, I think it's the other way around, actually. I mean, the reason why religion is such a great argument to be having is that it is our first attempt at making sense. I mean, r religion is what you get before philosophy. It's our first attempt at philosophy. Most philosophers began, started off as religious. Um, as did many ethicists. It's our first attempt at cosmology, um, first attempt at healthcare by means of miracle, alas, but still. <laughs> um, and prayer. It's, a bit, it's our first attempt to make sense. Um, but, uh, and science doesn't completely replace all those questions, but it says that there's no need for a supernatural attempt to answer them. In other words, if you say, because we don't know what the scientific origins of the Big Bang are, uh, which Father Lemaitre didn't know any more than I do, or Einstein did. There must be a supernatural explanation. That isn't logical at all. And if there was a supernatural uh, progenitor, where did that supernatural progenitor come from? Who created that? So you get nothing out of it but an infinite regression, and I think the meanest application to science is more satisfying than that, and much more likely to yield an answer that you can at least argue about. Whereas if you're simply told you have a creator and he has a plan for you, um, it explains nothing and it has reactionary implications because it suggests there are people who can't just tell you what to do. There are plenty of those as it is. Uh, people who say, God tells me to tell you what to do. And that's slavery. Incidentally, um, you make this point yourself, don't you, about this infinite regression of creators. And in fact, Aristotle concluded that the logic all of, of all of this would necessitate 47 or 55 gods. Yes. What's the mathematics? I have no idea. <laughs> I, there's a lot about Aristotle I don't understand. <laughs> and it's, some of it's in that song. That we should... <laughs> yes. From Wall Wollamulu? Well, the, the, I think it was actually the uh, University of Wollamulu. Yes. Wollamulu, so I knew I was pronouncing it. Yeah, yes. yes, yes. The Aristotle philosophy. was a bugger for the Aristotle, bottle. Aristotle, yeah, Plato, yes. <laughs> Never mind. John Stuart Mill of his own free will on half a pint of shandy got spectacularly ill. But Plato, they say, could stick it away. Half a crate of whiskey every day. <laughs> and of course Aristotle was a bugger for the bottle. Thomas Hobbes was a slave to his dram and Rene Descartes was pissed as a fart. I drink, therefore I am. <laughs> okay. If my wife was How there... How the hell did that happen? Yeah, I should really know. <laughs> Yes, Socrates himself is particularly missed. Lovely little thinker, but bugger when he's pissed. <laughs> then something about the raising of the wrist. Right. There's nothing yeah. Nietzsche couldn't teach you about the raising of the wrist. Yes, okay. <laughs> Let's get Manuel serious. Manuel Kant was a real piss <laughs> hand. <laughs> Very seldom stable. Martin Heidegger was a boozy beggar. He could think you under the table. <laughs> David Hume can out consume Victim Schopenhauer and Hegel. Hegel, yes, there you go. And Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein was a boozy swine who was just as sloshed as Schlegel. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's all they wrote. As you can see, Christopher's widely read. <laughs> okay, fast forward to today. Um, acutely aware that they will never be able to answer some of these big questions about existence. Some scientists have come up with the idea of quantum cosmology, and it, it seems that, and I think you almost alluded to this yourself, that quantum physics almost has a theological dimension mm. now. Could this become, in fact, the new religion? 
Well, uh, I think that there are signs of, I mean, I think that, look, to back up a bit, I think that the temptation to worship has to be admitted as being innate in us. I mean, uh, there are very few people who are born without it. Um, I think I may be one of them, <laughs> but I mean, I don't say I'm completely immune to superstition either. I mean, I'm a, I'm a primate. Um, I, I think I, for that reason, I don't think religion is eradicable or that it would be desirable if it could be eradicated. I think it needs to be, if you like, domesticated, uh, brought under control. Um, that very quotation from Marx that I used in his critique of Hegel um, uh, shows that he understands that this is a product of the human soul, if you wish, or human personality. It's not just the result of unresolved material contradictions. Thus, it would be, it is, it's been folly for any communist regime to try and put it down, to put that shortly. Um, so yes, it's possible that people could become worshippers of physics, yeah, or the quantum. Um, just as in my view, and it's, it's actually beginning to worry me, in some of the, the green and environmental movements, there's a feeling that we've brought punishment upon ourselves, you know, that we've sinned, and that we've, we've uh, and th there indeed there are people who look upon, I haven't been into this Gaia stuff very much, but who look upon the planet as in some sense something that needs to be propitiated and placated. I can, I can hear some echoes of this in, in some apparently modern and reason-based and evidence-based movements. Yep. So yeah, it's always there and you always have to be on the lookout for it. I'm actually talking about um, physicians, uh, well not physicians, but the quantum physicians, yeah. I suppose you would call them cosmologists. Uh, put very simply, um, the idea is that things can just happen spontaneously. Particles can pop into existence without warning and disappear without warning and the corollary of that, according to Paul Davies, among others, is that the entire universe could have just popped into existence. I'm reading this book about the quantum now and about Heisenberg. There was this discovery that it seems that a particle doesn't so much pop into existence, though it might, but it can be there and then be there, reassembled, with no one knowing where it was in between, which is like a poltergeist or something, except that it's not because there aren't any poltergeists and you can't measure them, whereas with this, there's a chance. Um, I haven't got very far with the book yet, but there's a chance of it being, of it yielding to analysis. Um, it's certainly the only method we have had any luck with in the past. And one potential... And of course, we don't like to think of ourselves as random. Um, it's not in us to feel that we're just an accident, any more than we can picture our own extinction, let alone the extinction of our whole, our whole species. But it, it has to be faced. It's no good saying, because that thought is depressing, we should banish it in favor of something more uplifting. Because that means you get all the bad news anyway, and in the meantime, you've been fooling yourself. Let's go to someone you talked about during your talk, but didn't sort of, we didn't go into any detail, Stephen Jay Gould and yeah. his work on fossils and the so-called Burgess Shale deep in the Canadian Rockies, which actually helped to establish the origins of human life, um, pinning it back onto this tiny little creature called the Pacaea grassalens. Tell us about that. Yeah, the, there's a, there's a, the Burgess Shale is this, some of you will, I'm sure, already know this, but it's a, it's a place in the Canadian Rockies where essentially half of a mountain fell away. Um, so you get a side view a cross section of a mountain looked at from the side. Very useful because you see all these stems and branches of life and the fossil record. You're not drilling down for it, you're surveying it like that. Scientists go there in a big way. It's, it's the best example we have. And what's very striking about it is how many of the branches and um, uh, sprigs go nowhere. They just taper off. Uh, Gould, in fact, says it's silly to think of evolution as a tree. It's much more... Uh, useful to think of it as a big bush. It goes in all directions. A tree seems to have a sense of upward phototropic movement. This is more like a bush that's growing sideways and so on. So the, the question is, suppose you could uh, scan all this picture onto a tape, mixing the metaphor slightly, rewind that tape to the, back to the beginning, play it again, there's absolutely no guarantee that it would come out the same way. In fact, the likelihood that it would come out the same way is almost nothing. Very sobering thought. 
And in the, in the succession of uh, evolutions that led to ourselves, there's one moment where there's a tiny creature called the Picaea gracilens, gracilens simply meaning graceful, meaning bendy, which has the beginnings of a vertebrae system, of a spinal column. Um, and that's the creature from which we got the idea of having a, a spine um, and built upon it. If it had been left out of the mix, there's no Homo sapiens either. And it's sort of that big. And if, if the tape was replayed, it might not show up in the right time and place. From which you conclude randomness and no plan. Well, certainly, I would certainly say no plan. Or, because I can't quite say that, because no, no one can be that certain, no plan that isn't fantastically wasteful, capricious, arbitrary, and, and run by a designer who half the time doesn't know what he's doing, a mad scientist in other words, <laughs> and possibly a very nasty one. I mean, you, you, in other words, you, certainly you can't say it's a benign plan, no. No, you could, you could not say this was a heavenly father plan. Um, it would, the, the implications of there being a planner of that plan are much more frightening than the implications of it being random. <laughs> we're, we're running towards the end, but I want to quickly go to uh, Stephen Jay Gould's own philosophy, because you mentioned it earlier. Um, he was not an atheist, in spite of understanding this. He was an agnostic um, who took the view that science and religion ask different questions about life. Um, and he reached this conclusion, if we keep science and religion apart, neither one can oppress the other. But in fact, he, he wanted to, and he said this, I believe with all my heart in a respectful, even loving concordat between science and religion. Now, you admire him a lot. Yeah, I do. I think he was one of the great educators of all time. And that's why it cost me a lot of pain to say why I disagree with him and, and at such length. When he was a boy, he was a... He was a Marxist, um, and I think he overcompensated for not being one by trying to be more friendly towards religion than it, than it deserves. Um, and I, well, for the reasons I've already given, I, I don't think it's true that there can be a real coexistence. I think they're constantly trying to patrol the same frontier, and in the case of religion, to cross it in, in inappropriate ways. I mean, why should it be that in the United States, great country of science, and technology and reason was this unceasing attempt to have nonsense taught in the schools with government money. They won't quit. They've been beaten back. They keep coming back for more. We, they, they try and smuggle it through customs. A new, it used to be when they were strong enough, they would ban the teaching of Darwin. Until the 20s, they could do that in some places. Now they can't do that. The next demand was for equal time, sounds fair, um, for what they then called creation science. Nice try. Um, <laughs> That was exposed as a fraud. Then they said, secular humanism is a religion. That, shan't, that could, shouldn't be taught either. Um, the latest is intelligent design. I refuse even to call it that. Uh, I refuse to gratify them by using the term. It's creationism. Um, and, the, and again, with the equal time demand, fairness, great American virtue. So um, after the biology class, we'll have the creation uh, period. And then after chemistry, where it'll be time children forget your alchemy books out. <laughs> this was taxpayers' money. And then we'll be doing, um, well, you can see how the rest of it will go. After astronomy, we'll be doing our zodiacs. <laughs> so, no, we're not having it. Now, why don't they say, I want to hear it from them, that uh, it's possible to be a religious person and not preach garbage in school. Let them be the ones to propose this compromise, and then if I see a genuine hand being extended, I might take it. But I think Stephen was attributing much more goodwill to the other side than it really manifests. I think this has to be a final question, really, uh, Christopher. Your critics sort of argue there's no light and shade, no room for disagreement in a, in a Christopher Hitchens argument. And uh, I mean, do you accept... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. I mean... <laughs> Do you, accept, do you accept, actually, that you are rather evangelical no. in your promotion of atheism? No, because I have, nothing to, I have nothing to convert anyone to. See, that's, ladies and gentlemen, you should regret that giggle. I mean, you will. Tomorrow you'll be sorry. Um, <laughs> I have nothing, I don't, I, I don't, I ask yourself, have I tried to persuade you of any one point of view? No, I've said, beware of anyone who says that you don't 
that, you've, that you already have all the evidence you need. That's been my constant point. We've, the only progress we've ever made that can ever hope to make is by continual doubt, skepticism, the measurement of evidence against theory, practice against theory. That's, the, that's not just, um, as I gave with the example of Father Lemaitre and the Pope, um, things cannot be, even if they're right, established as dogmas. Um, I think I rest my case. Couldn't we end on a more controversial note? <laughs> we can well, if something, you like. Something bitchier, I mean. I think I've got just the thing, actually, uh, because, uh, and, and it was Professor Richard Dawkins who, uh, who did this, um, put this kind of slight upon atheism, I suspect. He wants you all to be called brights. I guess because you're brighter than the rest of us. Yes. I wish, I really wish, I say in my book, he and Daniel Dennett, another great scientist and teacher, I really wish they hadn't done that. Because I think it's wrong perhaps three ways. I mean, no one could say Father Lemaitre was stupid, for example. That's one thing. Two, um, if it was a test of, of intelligence, it would have the unpleasant suggestion that that's how society should be ordered. I mean, like the Brave New World concept of the Alpha and the Beta and down to the Epsilon and so forth, which is a, a sinister behaviorist uh, form of utopia. And the third is that it gratifies exactly the suspicion of many religious people um, that they're looked down upon and scorned by the pointy-headed intellectuals and so forth. And I, I obviously promise you that I don't do that even with the real lowbrows and slope heads uh, among them. <laughs> <laughs> They're my fellow primates too. Let I me mean, so I, I, I was going to finish. The real I was going sort of to finish vicious, there. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to finish. Barely on evolved that. ones. <laughs> I don't want to finish on that bitchy. The ones note. whose eyes are so close together they could use a monocle. That's <laughs> it. Are you saved? <laughs> oh, shut up. Okay, just to be clear, and it's, it's obvious, obviously, to just about everybody, an atheist is a person who believes there is no God. An agnostic yes. believes that nothing is known or can be known about the existence or nature of God. Why is that a less rational position than yours? Sorry, I just jumped like a pea on a hot shovel because um, I had meant to say this when you said about Stephen calling himself an, ag an agnostic. Uh, I, I was a great, I would have been if I'd been around, and I still am, a great admirer of Thomas Huxley, um, who, the man who is the, I think, uncle of Aldous and Julian, um, who had the great, he was known as Darwin's bulldog. He had the great debate on Darwin at the Natural History Museum in Oxford with Bishop Wilberforce, known as Soapy Sam to his parishioners, who was a descendant of the great William. And Huxley creamed him on that occasion, as everyone Remember, so it, was, it was a walkover for our, our team. And so we're all, <laughs> we're all very grateful to Thomas Huxley, but I can't thank him for his coinage of the term agnostic, which was his bolt hole term. Again, to try for a compromise where I don't really think the, the basis for it exists. So you don't have to say you don't believe in God. You can simply say not all the returns, not all the evidence is, are or is in yet, so I, I won't declare. Now, I think that that's wrong twice. One, um, you're not saying that you cannot prove that there is no God. No atheist has ever said that. There is a scientist in America called Victor Stenger who's produced a book called God, the Failed Hypothesis, who goes as far now as to say science can definitively say there isn't. But, but I, I think that that's a very adventurous position. But the atheist view is, there's absolutely no reason ever been advanced by another primate to believe that there is one. And when you've got that far, you really ought to say there isn't, it seems to me. Not that, for that reason, I'm not sure. And it's completely not on all fours with the other position, which is evidence has nothing to do with it. Faith is much more important. Not only should you have faith, but you'll be saved if you do. Now, you that's not, I don't know. It's not the might be, it's not, it's, unless you do it with, like Pascal and say it's a vulgar bet, it's a wager, what have you got to lose? Which I think is morally creepy as well as evidentially unsound because if some huckster comes to me and says, look, 
he may not be there, but if he is, you've got everything to gain by saying you believe in him, even if you don't really. I say, well, then I don't think much of your God, because if there is such a person, and I spend my life arguing that there isn't, and I do my best, um, when I check out, if I'm, which I sure will, which I'm, if I find that I'm mistaken and I'm confronted with the guy, I would hope he would be able to say, I at least admire your honesty. <laughs> and, and I, okay, let's close on this, ladies and gentlemen. The, the Christians don't give their God that much credit. <laughs> so doesn't that say something both about the fear base and the fact base and the moral base of what their faith really is? I submit that it really does, and thus that one is morally healthier as well as much more likely to be studying science and reason objectively if one puts um, religion behind one. Ladies and gentlemen, save your applause because I'd just like to uh, say thank you. We, we see Christopher Hitchens here probably once a decade or something along those lines and uh, I hope we don't have to wait that long to see him again. I've certainly enjoyed talking to him. I'm sure you've enjoyed listening to him. Please thank him properly now. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice Tony Jones, ladies and gentlemen. Can I just, I don't know what an encore is in, the, in this environment. Perhaps he could just sing one verse. One more verse. Well, I've got to do it straight through. Go ahead. Yeah. Of the, the boozed out philosophers. Yes. Yeah. Of, 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 of Wally Malou, the Wally Malou philosophy department. Ladies and Bruces. Um, it's Eric Idle's great performance at the Hollywood Bowl. It's, uh, it's a real honor to be here, uh, it's Kay. Oh, Emmanuel Kant was a real pissant, who was very seldom stable. Martin Heidegger was a boozy beggar, he could think you under the table. David Hume could outconsume Schopenhauer and Hegel. <laughs> and um, Wittgenstein was a beery swine. Really, was, Descartes. Who, no, Descartes. Wittgenstein was a beery swine who was just as sloshed as Schlegel. There's nothing Nietzsche couldn't teach her about the raising of the wrist. Socrates himself was permanently pissed. John Stuart Mill of his own free will on half a pint of shandy got spectacularly ill. But Plato, they say, could stick it away. Half a crate of whiskey every day. Uh, Aristotle, Aristotle was a bugger for the bottle. Thomas Hobbes was a slave to his dram and René Descartes was pissed as a fart, I drink, therefore I am. <laughs> yes, Socrates himself is particularly missed. A lovely little thinker, a lovely little thinker, lovely little thinker, but a bugger when he's pissed. <laughs> <laughs> If the song had a title, which it doesn't yet, I think it should be called Reductio. <laughs> <laughs> this is ABC Fora.